oops, I, <laughs> hi there. Uh, it looks like I have um, connection now. I did. Oh shoot, okay, sorry, my phone seems to be going in and out. All right, sorry, I know, I hate when I start out the video with like, ah. okay. Looks like maybe I'm live. I'm gonna check on um, my Facebook page. Okay, yes, I am live and it keeps popping in and out and I'm not sure why. Um, very soon we're gonna have fiber optics out here to the farm and our connection will be stronger. But anyway, welcome, I'm Charlotte Smith of the Profitable Farm Facebook group. You can also find me at 3 Cal Marketing and um, author of the new book, Farm Marketing from the Heart which I got to speak on and teach on last weekend. So today we are going to talk about raw milk herd shares because there are so many questions and a lot of confusion on my part and it seems like everybody's part around them because they are confusing. I wanna catch you up real quick though on our weekend last weekend. So Joel Salatin uh, came to the farm. We hosted him here for two nights. We co-taught a workshop um, along with Elizabeth Rich we had 50 farmers come from all over as far east as South Dakota and, and south as Arizona and every state in between people made their way to Oregon and we got to sit in the backyard with him all day. Well, all of us teaching. It was amazing. It was really fantastic. And if you ever think, you know, you've read all his books, so um, you don't, there's nothing more you can learn from him. Well, yes, there is. <laughs> this guy is connected. You know, Joel Salatin, who I'm talking about, he's just connected to people all around the world and the perspective he has on farming and politics is endless. We got to sit around for hours and stayed up way too late talking about these things. So it was amazing. I'm also headed to Washington DC tomorrow where I get to work with the Beginning Farmers Institute. I'm gonna get this thing off my phone. Uh, I know there's a couple people in this group who will be there, so I get to teach marketing to them Sunday morning. Um, and then I'm going to be doing some lobbying, trying to get healthcare benefits for farmers. I'm sure it's not gonna happen in the time that I'm there, but maybe it's something we can look forward to down the road and then some more funding help for farmers. So I'll be working on that this week and thank goodness I have a wonderful team that keeps things running here on the farm. Anyway, the other part of my weekend last week was an attorney, Elizabeth Rich, who's a member of this group. She is president of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. And I want to start off by saying they, they will write your herd share agreement for you. They will work with you to create a legal contract. It's only $125 to become a member. And then that is one of the benefits. Cheapest deal ever. I've been a member for seven years. So if you want a herd share contract, um, that would be the way I would recommend you go about it. Contact them, join up, become a member and get that done legally. So um, just a little, a little story about the misconceptions I have. So herd shares vary, from the laws, the regulations vary from state to state. So in this Profitable Farm Facebook group, when we're all talking about our herd shares, keep that in mind. Um, I wasn't aware just how different they are until I sat down with Elizabeth and learned they're wildly different across the United States. So make sure you know your laws for your state. Some states, it is neither legal nor illegal, such as Oregon. It's not addressed by the law. Oregon and Virginia are two states that take a very different stance. So Oregon, we have lots of people doing herd shares, even though it's neither legal nor illegal. Even though they have the same policy of Virginia, it's not addressed by the law. There have been two court cases, and in the court case, the judge said herd shares are illegal. So there's no law against them, but these court cases uh, make the regulators especially say that it's illegal and, and you'll get a cease and desist probably if, if you do that. So just know that um, you have to check in with your state and see if they're addressed or, or not. And if they aren't addressed, what's the culture around that? I hoped to clear up a lot of things with this interview of Elizabeth and in the blog post, you will see a lot of that. But I also think what it emphasized to me is um, it is almost more confusing than ever because herd shares are a gray area. So I just wanna say, protect yourself. I've never been in court and had an attorney have to defend me, 
but Elizabeth went through all sorts of scenarios this weekend, and I tell you, it sounded very scary for me to imagine what those farmers that she has defended sitting there in court and them asking them things like, oh, so you lied about that, or, you know, you don't want to be in that position. So enough of a lecture, you know, if you're going to have a herd to share, be sure to protect yourself. So a few things that um, are, are really important is I always thought that in Oregon, since we have a cow, a law that allows us to sell raw milk if we have three cows or fewer, there are a lot of people who they get around that three cow law by doing a herd share. And I always thought that a herd share allowed you to sell other things such as cream and yogurt and butter, all that and also to deliver. A lot of people get around the not being able to deliver in Oregon by doing a herd share, but it does not automatically guarantee that. So, so just be careful, be aware. Um, again, my misconception was that, oh, if I want to be able to deliver and sell other value-added products, then I just need to become do the paperwork and become a herd share. Uh, not so easy, so make sure you look into that and don't assume because most states do have a law uh, uh, that you've got to have a dairy license and a dairy plant to make those value added products. So there, um, the Legal Defense Fund does take the stance that if you own a herd share, you're entitled to dairy products from that cow, but the farmer can't just go hire someone to make the yogurt or all be, uh, um, because you, know, you, you run into these regulations on making dairy products. So just be very careful about that and it's something to go over in your herd share agreement. Same thing, be careful on the delivery because that's that's not always clear. And again, like I said, this interview kind of made some things more confusing. All right, so um, one of the things is that, let me go on. Uh, somebody asked, does the herd share agreement include herd health protocols? Like if you're gonna have this agreement legally that you can sell raw milk, then shouldn't it also include a set of, of protocols that the milk needs to come from cows that are healthy, etc. Elizabeth, the attorney, have pointed out very carefully that they are attorneys, they are not dairy consultants, they are not farmers, so they do not include herd health protocols. So that's up to you. And I've got um, a download on right underneath this video, and if you click on that, there are six steps that I do in my barn to assure my milk is safe. Those six steps cover hundreds of safety precautions or include hundreds of safety precautions that we take in our barn. So just know that a, a herd share agreement contract is not going to protect you if you make someone sick um, because there's something in there and, and it's still up to you. And they, uh, the Legal Defense Fund does have a dairy consultant they will put you in touch with who will help you come up with your own herd health protocols, but that is not part of your contract or your agreement. So it's totally up to you to make sure your herd is healthy. Just because you have this contract saying you can sell raw milk, it won't protect you if, if something gets in there. Okay, so um, a lot of these things were questions that you guys had that I took out of the Profitable Farm Facebook group and asked Elizabeth, and one of them was um, in Utah, a dairy farmer was sent to cease and desist because the law just changed to that you could have two cows or 10 goats or 10 sheep if you're gonna sell raw milk. She has four cows, they were given a cease and desist. She wants to know how to fight it. And Elizabeth Rich was, um, she, she just pointed out that the law is the law. So if you're not complying with the law, they do have the right to give you a cease and desist. So if the law says two cows and you have four cows, um, it, you, you know, it's, it is against the law. However, it's important for you to really know uh, the, the letter of the law. Does that mean two cows per family member, two cows per household? Maybe you have, we have a rental house on our property. Maybe you have two households on your farm so you can have four cows. Does it mean that maybe your neighbor can have two cows and board with you so you have four cows but two belong to your neighbor? So really learn the letter of the law in your state in instances like this, like Oregon, we have a three cow law. So I could do the same thing. I could find out, does that mean my adult daughter who lives uh, off the farm can also have three cows and board them here and pay rent and then we have six? So it's really important to learn those things um, because if you're given a cease and desist, I know farmers who've been given a cease and desist, 
you that's immediate so you're dumping you know hundreds of dollars of milk down the drain so you don't want to get in that position so it really makes sense to really know your law and in today's blog post that is on 3cowmarketing.com uh, there are links in there where you can find your raw milk laws the legal defense fund has a map on that and it will tell what your state has going on so that's how you can find that out and really dig into what the letter of the law is in your state i can't emphasize enough because um, i've had a lot of farmers go out of business because they're given a cease and desist and they can't sustain that for for long enough before they can comply they're out of business all right a lot of people share herd share contracts um, i see it in the facebook group people will post their contract and say here's mine you can copy it and Elizabeth Rich, the attorney, cringed when I brought that up. And she said, this is absolutely, I'm going to quote her, pos absolutely positively a bad idea to take an agreement that one of your farmer friends or something you find on the internet and customize it to your farm because that'll cause you trouble. It's for that farm in that specific location, that farmer, their state. Everything is applicable and meant to defend, protect them and not protect you so again it's the best 125 dollars you'll ever spend to become a member of the legal defense fund and have a contract written up just for you and your farm don't borrow one don't copy one um, and the other point she wanted me to make about that is if they did your herd share contract the legal defense fund two years or more ago please get in touch with them again it's free if you're a member to redo it or have them at least take a look at it because things change, states change, laws change, regulations change all the time. So you've got to have them get eyes on your herd share agreement once again and update that if you did it two years or more ago. Some people did the herd share contract seven years ago. I've talked to them, they said, oh, we're set. We did it seven years ago. So get back in touch with them and revisit that because you need to make sure you're protected. Because again, I don't wanna be, be those people that she talked about representing in court. That sounds really scary to me. <laughs> I don't wanna do that. Plus, you know, who's gonna take care of things at home if you're off trying to defend yourself in court? Um, all right, so uh, uh, Crystal is in Nebraska and one of her questions was, she wonders if there's um, a reason, a benefit to her switching to her share structure instead of just direct sales, which they are allowed in Nebraska. And this is one where uh, she went on to say that if she could deliver, which they aren't allowed to do, but if a herd share contract allows her to deliver, she could potentially make more money because she would have more customers who would be open to getting her raw milk if she could just deliver. If it magically shows up on their front porch, like Amazon, um, they would be customers. So um, there are some things, again, this is gray area, it seems like there's so few black and white questions in herd share agreements. For instance, Elizabeth brought up that you could do a herd share and maybe um, figure out an agency agreement, and that is where you have someone deliver for you. But that is not legal in every state. Texas used to acknowledge agency agreements. It was acceptable to have raw milk delivered by this person that you had this agency agreement with. That has now changed. And it's not that a law has changed, it's that there's a new administration and the culture has changed. So it just, uh, this conversation highlighted to me more and more how important it is to stay in touch with what's going on in your Department of Ag, how it's changing, how the climate is changing, because what you could do last year, you might get in trouble for doing this year. And um, some of us are better with getting in trouble than others. I frankly don't have time for it so I just I need to work within the letter of the law and the spirit of the law because I don't have time I don't have resources to pay attorneys to get back to all these things so if that's you make sure you update keep updated on what your laws are all right so um, someone else brought up this question of a food co-op since herd shares aren't legal in California they set their farm as, up as a food co-op and Elizabeth said how wonderful that sounds, like people working together cooperatively, um, producing food and, and sharing food. But there are very strict laws around food co-ops. And ultimately, at the end of the day, all the profits need to be split up at, at the end of the year. And this is tracked very carefully. 
and split up um, between the members of the food co-op and there is no profit. The farmer makes no profit. So uh, again, be careful. If you think a food co-op is a way around some, you know, a herd share or a micro dairy not being allowed in places such as California, be very careful because they're very strict laws. You have to manage it very carefully. And at the end of the day, you don't make any money. Um, and, it, and again, um, not that it's all about money, but it's very expensive to milk cows. So you need something to pay the bills. And Lindsay Hickman asked, could it, could it be a CSA in California? No, as far as I know, no, I'm not the attorney. So Elizabeth Rich is part of this group. I'm gonna have her jump in here later and answer your question in here why, but no, that, that would um, not work either. So, uh, but, but I will have her answer your question and great question. Um, also then Dusty in California, who's a part of this group, says that Q fever did not used to be a problem and now Q fever is a problem, but um, it's not required testing. In some states it is, Oregon it's not, Washington it is. So if your state does not require you test for Q fever, Dusty asked, how responsible are you for an organism that gets in your milk that you didn't even know was there? And you are a hundred percent responsible. Elizabeth was very clear on this. If you're selling raw milk, you're a hundred percent responsible, whether you're ignorant of, you know, what you're, what's in there or not, that is not an excuse. You are responsible. So, um, I just think back to this E. coli case we had in Oregon, um, five years ago, we had a farm about 15 minutes from me. They had E. coli in their milk. Did they know it was there? Of course not. But ignorance of the E. coli did not make them not responsible. You know, it was, it was, they were still responsible for E. coli being in the milk, even though they were not aware of it. So that always comes back to me that, 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 that particular incident, because I knew the family personally, that you're responsible for anything in your milk. So keep up on what's going around in your area, whether it's Q fever or, you know, uh, any other things that might be happening. Uh, just know that you're responsible, whether you know it's there or not. And then another really good question people had is if you're on the border of a state and you can have a herd share, the neighbor state does not allow them, such as Tennessee and Virginia, can someone from Virginia where herd shares are illegal, can a mom in Virginia have be a member of your Tennessee herd share and come pick up her milk and take it home to Virginia and yes, 100%. So yay, some good news in all this, um, you know, cautionary news. That's some really good news that you can always personally, you can transport your personal milk across state lines. Now, if you had a delivery person going and doing that, um, that could cause some troubles. So, you know, you need to look in on that. But if someone in Virginia wants to be a member of a herd share in Tennessee or some other states where that's happening, they can totally do that and transport their personal milk home to their house for their family. So that was really good news. Um, and, and you might have heard that raw milk can't cross state lines. Well, that's commercial. So we can't drive a truck from California where it's legal in stores to Oregon and sell it on the farm here. You can't do that because that's commercial transporting of raw milk across state lines. So don't do that. But if you're taking your family's milk across state lines, you can totally do that. Um, so the other um, point, oh, someone asked, pet milk is, re is allowed in their state, a pet milk license <clears throat> or a herd share agreement. So which would be better for them? Well, if you're a pet milk license, you have to lie. So if you have, because you have to say you're just making it for pets, right? And you're lying in there. And, and um, you know, when they question you in court and they're very intimidating, you know, are you really going to lie after you've taken that oath? So just go with the herd share because you don't have to lie and you don't have to reapply for that license every year like you do the pet milk license. So if you have the option of a herd share and pet milk license and you're selling to people, then definitely go for the herd share. That was another one that was a pretty clear answer. And that was Laura um, uh, in Tennessee. So it, it's nice to get a clear answer from an attorney because so many laws are... Uh, uh, just, you know, there's multiple answers depending on your situation. So, um, let's see, bottom line, if you're producing raw milk, it's really important to stay up on the laws because they change, they change without you hearing about them. And the other thing that I want to encourage you to do, and Elizabeth Rich encouraged me to encourage all of us to do is 
get involved legally. Like I'm headed to Washington DC tomorrow to lobby lawmakers um, on, you know, I've got three talking points that we farmers in America need. That's just me getting involved. Nobody uh, voted to have me go do that. It start, it's, I think it's a lot easier than any of you think to call your legislators in your state and start meeting with them. Last year, um, I had the assistant to one of our senators because they were back in DC, but the assistant is here locally. He came to my house, he sat down for tea and scones. He didn't eat any scones, but he drank something, coffee. <laughs> and we had a nice chat about the struggles I face as a small farmer that he did not know about. Um, and this was to help uh, with, there's the Prime Act, you know, where we want to hopefully be able to allow custom slaughterhouses to then let us sell our meat retail if it's um, slaughtered in a custom slaughterhouse instead of you have to sell it bulk. People have to own the whole animal. So he wasn't even aware that that was a struggle we faced, that you know I would be more profitable and sustainable if I could sell this custom slaughtered meat by the piece instead of by the quarter animal or half animal um, because USDA processors are so far and few between and hard to get into. So that's just an example of it is way easier for you to get involved politically than you think. And I really want to encourage you to do that because it has been really eye-opening for me. Um, and just because I made that phone call, now I'm on the senator's radar and they will reach out to me and ask me things like, if we voted for this, what would you think? And that is really cool to feel like you have a little bit of influence. Because I think a lot of times as Americans, we think, oh, who am I to, I can't change a law, but you can change a law. And um, Elizabeth said that it takes about 20 voters um, before they start. Uh, and when you have 20 voters, which really isn't that many, they start recognizing that maybe there's something wrong with a law because they figure 20 voters represents about 2,000 people. So if you have something going on in your state, or maybe start in your county level, get involved, make some phone calls, talk to some people, and I think you'd be surprised at how you can change laws. Um, Christine Anderson is, maybe you guys have heard of her. She lives about 20 minutes from my farm. We could not advertise raw milk in Oregon. She, along with uh, the Institute for Justice, the attorneys sued the Oregon Department of Ag and won the right for us to be able to advertise our raw milk. That was one woman and she did it while nine months pregnant. So <laughs> um, if you think someone else is gonna take care of these laws, don't, let's all get involved. You know, here I am on the eve of headed to DC to lobby and I wanna use that as an example to encourage you guys to get involved with your laws. What if all the farmers were out there you know, pulling for these laws. How cool would that be? So, so that's it for today. If you have more questions, be sure to ask them below. Get involved politically. Be sure to be very aware of what the requirements are in your state for raw milk herd shares. Lastly, and most importantly, make sure you work with the attorneys at the Legal Defense Fund to get your herd share set up for your farm in your state with your um, environment, okay? Now, um, let's see what Sherry says. Sherry says, we're in Utah, we have a license for manufacturing. That means turning our milk into a manufactured product. We may not hold a herd share license. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm sorry. I'm gonna finish reading this on the Facebook page because I can't see it on here clearly. Um, and, okay. We may not hold a herd share license, however, we are being allowed to sell raw milk from our farm on days which we do nothing in our commercial kitchen. So we make caramel sauce on Monday through Wednesday, soap and wax on Thursday, and reserve Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for raw milk sales. So Sherry, that is a super example. She's in Utah of people finding, it sounds like you have a legal way around the law. Because remember, if you're doing it illegally, I've just had so many friends eventually get caught and given a cease and desist and that you don't make you know, you go out of business when that happens. Sherry, if this is um, legal, it sounds like it's working great for you. That is fantastic. And it sounds like something a lot of other people are going to be interested in. So I want Elizabeth to jump in here and take a look at that too, because how cool is that? A license for manufacturing. So, and I'd love to hear more about that too. All right, Robin, you are so welcome. She said, thank you for doing this. It's really important information. You guys, um, just read the blog post. I've got more details there. Know that herd shares are a gray area. They aren't black and white. They're confusing for me 
and and it seems like a lot of people and even I think the attorneys are confused sometimes so <laughs> Um, yes, Sherry says we have no time for illegal stuff. Thank goodness. No, we don't as farmers. And then Clay and Ashley say, do you happen to have any info for Canadian producers or somewhere I can start looking? Oh my gosh. So I don't know much about Canada, except that I think it's illegal, right? Raw milk is illegal. Um, I've just heard a lot about Michael Schmidt and the farm to consumer legal defense fund is for is american so i don't know that they work internationally yet however maybe i'm wrong on that and again i'll have elizabeth in here answering your question on that ashley um i do know i think people in um, canada that sell it as body products like body lotion body cream uh bath milk that sort of thing i've just heard of that i i had a conversation. I, I don't know anything about that. So I don't know where to send you other than reach out to the Legal Defense Fund too. And in the blog post today, I've got all their contact information in there too. So thanks you guys. It's been really great. Ask questions below. If you have more, I'm going to have Elizabeth Rich jump in here later and answer any. Um, and you know, if I, I'm going to be with some other farmers in Washington, DC. So I'm going to try to do a live video from like the, not the Capitol building, maybe the Washington monument. I don't know if they allow that sort of thing. I may be given a cease and desist. We'll see, but we're going to have some fun with it. So take care. Um, those of you affected by these hurricanes, we are praying for you. What a terrible situation to be in and, and hang in there. Um, I, I just, I couldn't imagine farming or living in a place where you're worried about your safety like that. So take care and everyone have a super weekend. I'll talk to you soon.